Okay, in the resources page of the class, you see a little text there to help you prepare for the final. Some advice. There is a practice final. Uh, it has probably more questions than are going to be in the final. But uh, if you practice that, I am even giving you extra credit for actually practicing for the final, just to go through the information that's included in this book. So if you look there down at the bottom of the course, uh, let's go back to the course page. I'll bring up a separate course page. Down in the assessments version, assessments listed down there. Here we go, here we go. Practice final quiz, extra credit. You have three chance i think i've set, set up for three chances to take that if you want to review it multiple times of course i'm not showing you the correct answers but if you have a confusion on any question that you think you had the answer right you keep getting it wrong just send me an email and say oh maybe the key was wrong the answer key might be wrong or the question if it's worded abstractly and confusing i might say yeah that's a bad question we'll either throw it out or say here's the correct answer so you can practice that and your preparation. And then back at the top there in the resources, practice going through the various chapters that we've covered and think about some example functions that I either might have you write from scratch or I might give you part of it and you have to fill in the rest of it. Uh, for example, a typical problem when you're practicing your array skills is you take an array and do some processing on it such as adding up all the elements of the array. Now, I can't guarantee I'm going to have you adding up the elements of the array, but if you can do adding all the elements of the array, you could do counting how many are there, counting the, how many are even, uh, multiplying them all together, processing the elements of an array. And typically, you have that for loop going through your array. And we'll be looking at some of that as we are actually finishing up the assignment for Chapter 14. Counting something in an array. Oh, and suppose you can add them up in a normal for loop. Could you do it recursively? Can you add the elements of an array up using a recursive function? And remember recursive, just to thinking about how that would happen, you take the first element, add it up to the function that returns the sum of the rest of the elements in the array. So you probably would need a parameter for where do I start when I start counting the elements in the array. So this one may need some modification to make it recursively. You know, I, I can't just take an array. I, if I want to handle an array, I need to know well, where do I start adding them up. So some kind of recursion. And for great practice, go to codingbat.com. My favorite place is to go to look for Good quiz questions for code practice. Now that, I'm likely to give you a piece of code with maybe part of it done where you have to fill something in. So that's handling strings, dealing with arrays, and today we get into a little bit of handling vectors. So there will be some questions, mostly from the practice quiz in the chapter, about using, they may have one or two about using a vector. And that was something that was towards the end of the Array chapter 6, where we started. All right, so before we get into finishing up your uh, chapter 14 examples, let's think about where we left off here. And I'll start the presentation right here. Thinking about removing elements from an array. We had that as part of chapter 14. Do you have a remove function written for that example? Bring up your bring up your chapter 14 project, and I'm going to help you finish that. Uh, there was an in 14-2. They asked you to write a remove an element from an array routine. And think about how we I'll just dr quickly draw here what we would do to remove an element from an array. We're handed an array, and we like to represent arrays by little boxes. And I'm asked to remove. Some element. So I'm going to be given the array. I'll call it A. And some element to remove. It's going to be an integer. And I'll call it R. So what do we do to remove an element? Say we have 
some values in here in one, two, three, and R, their number to remove is there. Fifty-seven. Not a sorted array necessarily. What do I do to remove R? Well, I need to find out where it is. So I read through the array. Once I find that element in the array, to remove it, this is where some people create a new array that has one less element than that one and copy all the things into a new array. So this is this is a solution style one is make a new array that's one less, so it has one, two, three, four, five, only five elements in there, two, three, four, five elements, and we start copying one, two, three, skip that one, and seven, and make a completely new array. That's one way to solve the problem. And then, if I'm doing this, this function has to return Instead of a void function, it will return a, a new array. And to make a new array, I would do, say, I'll call it I, I'll call it A result, uh, sorry, int bracket bracket A result equals new array, and whatever the length of my array is. A dot length minus one. That is not how the book asks us to do it. Although that's one way I would do it. The book says we're given a parameter here. We're not only given the integer array, we're returning, instead of a new array, we're returning the length of the new array. Return new link. And that solution, instead of creating a new array, we take the same array we're working with and we leave everything alone in the first few parts. We leave those elements alone and what we do is we shift over the elements that was 50 here and 7 there. We shift them over by one, and then we return that link, new link. We return a variable saying, here's how many valid elements are in the array. And that's the way the author of this particular one, Malik, likes to handle arrays in the examples that they are given. What's the, what's the advantage of this method? Just keeping track of how long how many elements I'm keeping on are valid in the array versus this method of creating a new array? What's the advantage of yeah, less processing? I'm not continually reallocating arrays. What we're doing is we're we're rearranging. Oh yeah, we just yeah we end up with a second array and we skip when we're copying one array to another we skip yeah we still have the old array yeah yeah it's using twice the more space allocating arrays the thing is when we're working on smaller programs we let the compiler deal with that and we let our fast PC handle so what that we're allocating arrays it's easier to deal with a new array than rearranging an old array so. The processing is a little more tedious here rather than, hey, I'm creating a new array, skip over that element. The logic is a little simpler to handle when you're dealing with multiple arrays, and we'll just ignore the part about performance is poor. Because it kind of takes a little more thinking, maybe that's one reason Malik uses the, let's not reallocate an array, let's rearrange the array. That's the solution they have. And then you have this extra variable all the time keeping track of how many elements I'm actually using in an allocated memory. So this is the remove that the author uses. And that's, a, that's the one I'm going to illustrate here. In the remove, we have an, uh, an array. There's, the, there's that variable keeping track of how many elements are actually used, being used in the array. 
this is the item that I want to remove from the array. So three parameters instead of just two, the array and what I want to remove. So I'm initializing some variable, keeping track of whether I found something or not. And once I find it, I'm going to uh, remove it. And actually, I wrote this wrong. It's This is remove, not remove at. So I better fix, I'm going to fix that. I realize I wrote this remove at. Let me move that for a second here. This is remove, not remove at. The remove at is going to come next. All right, here we go. There we go. All right, back to this. There it goes. It's remove, takes an array, keeps track of whether I found it or not. Now, while I'm reading through a loop here, while well, found is not equal to length, and I see I'm missing a curly brace there, or no, maybe I'm not. There's only one statement. I didn't need a curly brace. Look what's happening here. While well, not found and i is less than to my array length, what's this? Go, what's going on here? Found equals int array i plus plus equals equals remove item. We'll come back to that. Basically what I'm doing is looking through inter iterating i until I find the remove item or I've hit the end of the array. Now once that loop is done, if I have found the element in the array, that's Okay, I hit increment guy, and I hit the item R that I want to remove. Now, I shift everything over. Int array i minus 1 is equal to int array of element at position i, incrementing i while I do that. And then, once I'm done, I return an array that's one shorter than the thing I have just removed from the array. And if I have not found anything, the array length has not changed, I just return the same length of the array. Now let's analyze this piece of code here because uh, it'll help us help you understand exactly what's going on. And you, when you're reading someone else's code, it's going to be written different than you might have written it. And I'm starting to throw in kind of shortcuts that you find when you're reading other people's code, like on Stack Overflow when you're looking for uh, solutions. So back at this very first line, there's three things happening in that one statement. And one thing to remember when you're reading code, remember what, what the compiler is doing. What's on the right side is going to be assigned to what's on the left side when I have an assignment statement here equal. So the actual activity or the calculations done by your compiler read them from right to left because we have to calculate something here and assign it here so three things or two things happening over here on the right side i am comparing what i see in interray at position i and after i'm done incrementing i remember the post increment i read the value of i to find that position in the array and then at the same time I read i, I'm post-incrementing it. Very common to see that, so I'm throwing it in this example code. So I'm comparing. Are they equal? If they are, then I return either a true or false. And at the same time, while I'm looking in that element, I'm incrementing that variable i. And if they're found to be, if they're true or false, then I, oops, then I assign that value to found. And of course, the loop will end if found ever turns out to be true. So if I do find the variable remove item that I'm looking for, I will already have been incremented one past the location where it found it. Well, that means that I is at the next location. Therefore, this loop here keeps going while i is less than the, the length of my array, move what's found at position i right now into the, the position just to the left of it. 
and again incrementing i after I've read its value. So a shorthand solution to removing this element remove item from the array, it's setting up my variables, while well, I haven't found it and I'm not at the end of the array yet, keep incrementing i while I compare it to what I'm looking to remove. And if I ever find it, I set my Boolean variable found to be true, and I'm done with this loop. Here I have to have an if, because I'm not sure if I'm at the end of the array or I have found it. If I have found what I'm looking for, I shift over all the elements, putting what's at position i into position i minus 1, and then incrementing i. And once I'm done with that loop, return the length of my array minus 1. Just for less typing, whenever there's only one thing to do in a loop, I skip having the curly braces. You don't need curly braces if there's only one thing to do in a loop. Any questions about that particular thing? That's the remove function. And if you have any trouble, you can go back to the video and stop right here and copy the code. I think that's good, all good code. Interray, the, the location i, as I'm looking, is increasing every time I look at location i. Is that what you're asking? And remember, i is the location. Whenever, whatever in brackets is the location that I'm looking at. Once I see that re remove item is there, then found is true, and I end this loop, and I jump down to here if I have found it. And remember what I'm doing. I don't care anything about what, so, what I've looked at so far. What I care about is now that I've found it, shift everything else at position i, assign what's at position i, to be in what is at position i minus 1. That's the shifting over of the elements to the right of the, the element I found. Okay, now the next 14-3 code, the remove at function. This function, instead of looking for a value to remove, it's already, it's being told what element I want to remove an item at. That's why they call it remove at. It's the location. And of course, comments here would be helpful, but it would use up my screen space. So be liberal in your comments. Explaining this con this function removes the element at index named index at location index of an, of an array with a with a length of a of a length. And because I'm being told where to remove, I'm as, I'm assuming that they're giving me a valid location to remove. I can just return the length of my array minus 1. So this is a much simpler uh, method because all I do is at the position index, I know that's where to start. By being told where to remove an, an element, all I'm doing is starting there and whatever's at index plus 1, I assign it to be what's at array at position index, and then increment index. Another post increment, rather than a, rather than two statements, I can rather than saying array index or interray bracket index equals interray index plus one, and then index plus plus. I can do that all on one line. And again, if you write if you uh, find it more readable and understandable to make that two separate statements. Go ahead and do that when you are writing the code, but you may find other people when you're reading other code, you will often find this. So I want to make sure you, you've seen that and understand what's happening. That's a very common thing to do. It's like, okay, I'm going to assign what's at index plus one into position index, and the coder will think, well, I'm going through this loop, and I need to increment index each time. Rather than writing a separate line, they'll say, oh, yeah, once I see what's at index, increment it. That will be the same as incrementing after I've done this assignment.
Now, remember the post increment. There is the definition of removing an, an item at that position. So very three lines, a it's loop indexed. and a return. It's that's the location of what I want to remove in an array. Remember, this is based on the idea that I'm not reallocating a new array. I am using an array, keeping track of how many useful items I have, and then telling this function, remove the item at a particular location. There is no error checking going on here. What kind of error checking would I be doing if, I, if this were completely bug-free code. Yeah, making sure index is greater than or equal to zero and less than a link. So I would be doing some checks if I were doing real full error checking. And often what I'll put in the code is assume, and you'll see that in questions, assume they are giving you valid parameters. But with full error checking, you would add some checks is index greater than or equal to zero and less than length and also is length greater than zero and another check might be is the array not a null pointer because sometimes you may actually you may handing in an array that has nothing in it and, and so you would check for int array being null itself yes yeah you can use that code Oh, that would be in the definition of a remove at in the sorting.java module because this all has to do with practicing sorting and dealing with arrays. Uh, actually, you could put it in the main, since it's not specifically related to sorting, you could even put it at the bottom of JFrame main as another method in JFrame main. I think that's where I actually put it. I just made a, another method at the bottom of my main JFrame. And I'll show you the code. I want to go show you the code right now and we'll test it. So I go over here to Eclipse. There is my user interface I built. I gave to you, I modified a few things. I added, and we're gonna hopefully get to this, the test of the binary search. I added a text field so I can tell it what to search for in my binary search test. Let's run this and see what happens. The output when I do the remove at, actually we'll, do, we'll test, we'll do the remove first. I create a simple little array and then I remove the number four from the array and I display what's in the array after I'm done. And sure enough, the number four got removed from the array. The remove at test, I do a similar thing. I create a simple little array and I say, let's remove the item at location four. Well, at location four should be zero, one, two, three, four. That means it should remove the number five from the array. And sure enough, the resulting array skips over element number what used to be at position four is now the seven so i can tell that it worked by running the test now let's look at the code that did these two tests and i can run the test again i am always appending to my little output text area remove test the same array it gets created removes element of value four from that array Remove at, removes the element at location number four from the array. And I can stop this and now jump back into the code. And this one happened to have the code at the bottom of JFrame main. Uh, yeah, I think that's a better place to put it. Then I don't have to do a sorting dot remove at. I can just call the remove at function. And let's find it down here. Here's my remove function. I added a few uh, comments in there, and it should be about the same code. Let's see here. Oh, notice I had curly braces here, but I don't really need them, so I removed them from the from the uh, slide because that used that extra line. But it doesn't hurt to put them in there. You don't have to re, uh, remove them. There's the looking for the remove value. I think in the book it called it remove item. But I get, I get tired of really long variables. I tend to like variables with names of about four characters or less. It's because the lines get long and it's hard to show them on one screen. There is the looping for looking for rval. And 
Once that's done, either I hit the end of the array, and notice I use I instead of index. The name of your variable is your choice, as long as it follows the same rules. <laughs> yeah, it, it should. I set mine to automatically save the source code when I run. There's a little checkbox there. I, I, oh, what's in the, what goes in the array? Is that what you're asking? No, no. And I haven't I haven't sent it to GitHub. So uh, I'm leaving it for you to add that to your code. Yeah, you may. Do you have all the code in there? Yeah. Okay, I forgot. I didn't remember exactly what I gave you in the remove item. So if it's in there for you, all you have to do then is uh, do the testing part of it. So if you have the remove and the remove at, there's the remove at. See how simple remove at is? Now to actually test the code, Here's the part. I don't think I gave you this. Let's look at the testing of the code. A quick way to find the code, either by scrolling up or come to design view. If it takes a long time to switch to design view, just scroll up into the code. If I go to the remove test, here's the code for remove test, where I create an array. Now, did I give you this code? I'm not sure you have this in there. In the action listener for the remove and the remove at test where I generate the array. And we, we had reviewed this, I think, on Monday, so you might have this code already. There's This is the code where we create an array. We display what's in it, run the remove, and then display what's in it again. This is the test of remove. Okay. Now on the test of remove at is right here. I basically do the same thing, making a slightly different array here in the test array. I put a few more interesting numbers in there. And I call remove at this time instead of remove. And I, stu I still give it four. This time four is the location, not the value I'm looking for. So that would mean zero, one, two, three, four would be the where number five is right now is at location four. If it's working, that then gets removed. Now, do you have remove at? The remove at test code? So basically what you do, you can copy paste this whole section of the remove, what's using what's being used to test remove, and simply paste it here. Maybe put a few more interesting values in the test array. And rename this to remove at and you've got the testing code for remove at remember what what i did was i create an array list what's in it appending it to that output text area run the remove at and then list what's in that array again and with a little test here if the link hasn't changed then i know that i had an error trying to remove that element I just did that just to make sure I could display the results. If it didn't find it, it should display an error removing. So you ready to go on to the, the next part of this assignment, which is testing the, well, we did the testing of the insertion sort last time, right? Now I want to jump to the insertion sort vector, actually using a vector that's being sorted. Let's just review how, how the insertion sort worked, and then we'll know how the vector worked. Here's the insertion sort uh, action listener. Remember, my list is a global variable that if it doesn't have anything in it, I need to click the create an integer list. That's that my list. If my list is not created, it'll jump over this. I got tired of seeing errors when I had forgotten to create that list. I keep, I 
grab what time it is, run the insertion sort. I get the time, run the insertion sort, get the time again, and then compare time start to time end, subtracting to tell me how long it was. Let me zoom out just a little so you can see a little bit more code. Now this is what we reviewed on Wednesday. We capture the time. I just added the check that my list is not null. And I put a little comment here. Make sure my list has been filled with random numbers. And I filled it with 100,000 random numbers last time. 100,000 numbers to be sorted currently for me on this piece on my laptop takes about three seconds. Yep. Text area sort output dot append. And I've noticed what I'm doing is I'm putting a backslash n return new line as I'm displaying output in text area. So let's quick look at insertion sort and then we'll sort a vector. So looking back at insertion sort, which is, where is it? It's down here somewhere in my sorting algorithm. Here's my insertion sort. There's the binary search. Binary search. We did a couple versions of binary search. There's my insertion sort. Written exactly as in the book, where I'm looking at every element, starting at element number one, not at element number zero. If it's greater than the element to my left, basically this loop looks to the left until I find a place for it right here and then shifts everything to the left finally finds a location for it and assigns that location to be the value that is out of order so you, we have this code and I guess I'll, I'll slowly scroll through this in case someone watching the video needs to see the set of the whole code here the insertion sort, looking through each element. If anything to the right of the element is larger, find a spot for that new one versus assigning it to temp. And now shifting everything to the right until I find something that is greater or to the left of me is less than my number or keep shifting while it's greater than the number to the left or less than the number to the left. And then once it finds that position, putting temp in that position. So that's the insertion sort for regular integers. But now we're dealing with vectors. Searching back in our memory for when we covered vectors way back at the end of chapter six. Here is the way to, to uh, do the insertion sort using a vector. In any comments that I find out on the internet in help with vectors, I'm finding people often suggesting use array lists instead. And that's what I would recommend as well because I kind of believe them. But because they use vectors and ask for use cert insertion sort using a vector, I decided to do the way the author, Mr. Malik, asked for. So here's how you define a vector of strings. Vector less than and then the type that tells you that this is a vector of strings and I'm giving it a variable named v string so v, v string is a vector of strings this little guy yeah I'm not sure what you're asking so, 
Well, yeah, when I'm adding, when I'm putting elements in it. Yeah. Uh, to get at elements in a vector, I have to use the get and set methods. Do you have to put Do you have to put it here at string every time for each variable? So let's say go if 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 I want to treat v string as a vector, yeah. But if you have another variable that's coming in, let's say like this. What if you have another variable, like another vector? Yes, another. Yeah, vector. I would have to declare it the same way. Okay. Just as though I were passing two integer arrays, I say int bracket first array comma int bracket the other array. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. So here's the code for sorting using insertion sort a vector. Now, one way to think about this, let me pop back to my presentation here. One way to think about that is when I'm dealing with vectors, think of them just like I solved my array problem. I can put things into a vector this way. I have an array of strings, and if I want to fill a vector of strings with some values, I can just do this arrays dot as lists s uh, an array of strings basically fills my vector of strings with uh, the values and this is all on one line vector string v string new what happened equals our v string equals new vector of strings here is how I fill my vector of strings. And to actually assign values into vectors, uh, that comes right here. To assign values into a vector, I can do a V, or to read values from a vector, I can do vstr.get. The get method reads the value. So that's analogous to the array of strings location. So get location, think of that as if I had an array, it would be like in bracket location. So when I'm dealing with a vector to get something at a location, it's verse vster, the name of my vector, dot get. If why not I assign something into my vector as though it were an you know similar to an array, instead of bracket location, it is set location and then the value. So I have getters and setters now. If I'm dealing with vectors. So when I'm dealing with sorting a vector, I pass a vector as a string. If I have a string whose value is this, whose location is zero, I can get the location zero and maybe do something with it, or I can assign the string value to a particular location, such as at that bottom line. Okay, now back to the code now. Now that we've quickly lightning speed reviewed vectors, here is the code for doing an insertion sort using vectors. And because this is kind of new back in the using of vectors, which we didn't cover very heavily, I'm giving you this code. So it's right here. You can review the video if you need. Here is the actual code that works. So look what happens. Just like I did with the array, I'm starting at position one, going through all the elements all the way up to the end of my vector of strings. So instead of dot length, it's v string dot size because it's a vector. I'm assigning the variable temp to be a string at position in my vector at position i. And I have j, variable j, starting at position i minus 1, and I keep looking, I keep incrementing j, no, yeah, I keep incrementing j if, actually, I, I decrement j until I've either gone to the beginning of my list or the element at position j is uh, still greater than uh, the element at position at temp. This is a strange piece of code right here. Let's look at what this is doing. 
Remember, we're comparing strings now instead of integers. And so we have to alphabetically compare strings instead of is one number greater than another. I have to check is one string alphabetically greater than another string. And that's why we use the compare to. Compare to is the method to compare whether a string is alphabetically in the right order. That's why we're doing the compare to. If you hover over that, you'll get an explanation of what compare to does. And if compare to is confusing, go to uh, the Oracle pages and they'll do some explaining and examples. But I'm giving you the code here. What this means is, I should probably put a comment in here. Find the correct position for string temp in the vector in in v string compared to returns greater than 0 if this element v string at position j is greater than in the wrong order of temp i keep decrementing j stopping if j ever gets equal to zero i keep decrementing j until i've found something to the left of it that is less than j that's the same as finding the right place for that string this code looks different than what's in the book in the insertion sort because i went to wikipedia and i kind of like their algorithm for the insertion sort they use short variable numbers for variables and they do a quick little algorithm here's the algorithm for the insertion sort from wikipedia they give me a nice concise definition of, of insertion sort and i thought you know i liked how concise that was so i used that same definition using those same variables and i wrote my code to follow exactly how they did it on Wikipedia. I find it a little easier to read with shorter variable names. This is the part that's probably the hardest part of this, how to compare whether two strings are alphabetically in the right order. What this means is keep decrementing J until it's in the right place. Now, because this code is kind of confusing, I'm giving it to you. I'm not going to give it to you on GitHub. I'm giving it to you here in the video. To test it, let's quick look at the test in the last minute that we have here. In the testing of it, here's what I do. Let's see where that testing of it. I just come here and double click on insertion sort vector test. And here is the code. I create the array that's completely out of order. I put those values in my vector v string. And then I display my vector. This time I'm using a little for loop, a shorthand version of the for. They call this, sometimes they call this a for each loop. For every string in v string, I append that value to the text area sort output. Then I run the insertion sort on the vector, and then I display the contents again. Your typical testing uh, uh, cycle. Display what you have, run the test, display the results. That's the basic testing cycle. I run this, and here we go. It displays the array, oh, and it crashed. I had this working, I promise. I'm happy to gonna go figure out what happened in the code. I will figure out what happens in the code and display the correct answer here. I'm sure it was something simple. Maybe I had a little typo in there. 
So watch the video for the solution to my crashed insertion sort test. And I also will give you, I'll, I'll do a walkthrough of the binary search in case you want to help completing that. The binary search is fairly easy. Uh, read through the book, but I'll give you the solution for that code as well. So for your hard work, watching and maybe watching a video tour, you will have the solution to all the chapter 14 exercises. So then you can get that done with and submit the solution, and then you can go back and practice, review any of that practice code there in the final. And on 9.30 on Monday is when the final is scheduled. There will be a smattering of questions from all the chapters we covered with a few code examples, just piece, snippets of code. All right. See you Monday. No, I think I'm good. I just had a question that came up about that whole model view controller thing with Mike. Is he, or Dave, is he still teaching McElroy? No. Because he had suggested the model view controller code and the ODBC. I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. I mean, and so I was asking Ann about, do we want to cover that? Or how was he covering that? Maybe do that's a. Do you have a separate model page from the one that you were I don't know. That's what I was asking Ann is how could I, could I see what the lesson plan you used? You have access to your model page from the fall. Yeah. He started that. Oh, class. okay. So he was using that whole different book then. He, you know, okay. Yeah, he was using a different book, and that had Ann confuse. So that's maybe that's just a remnant of what Dave was. So as far as getting a hold of his old movie yeah. stuff. Yeah, uh, no, I didn't realize. Okay, I didn't realize that class. his. Okay, that's his fall stuff. Okay. Yeah, they must have had a new class for you. Yeah, after talking to Ann, she said, "Hey, use my lesson plan." So I was happy to do that. But she's gonna go with a different book too, apparently. Okay. We'll be I'm keeping in contact with Ann. This is the code that I use to create a stream of, or a vector full of strings. Could have done that on one line by putting all of this right inside of here. But just to make it a little more readable, I made the array first, a regular string array, giving it those values completely out of order. And then Declaring the vstr variable as a vector string or a vector of strings, and then creating a new vector of strings, handing it the array as list. Look for a few coding examples and handing the constructor for a vector allows you then to have a vector then of strings. And this method here to iterate through all the elements of the vector of strings, appending them to our text area output, putting little square brackets around it to show the values in that vector string, and then running insertion sort vector. And then once the vector sort has run, displaying the vector again to see if it really got sorted. Okay, I discovered where the error in my code was. When I adjusted my algorithm to match more closely the algorithm at Wikipedia, I saw a problem. And here is the code right here. I was using the wrong values right here, causing the algorithm to have an index out of the bounds right at this point right here. So here is the code for the insertion sort vector, taking a vector of string and sorting it. And to prove that it works, running the code here, when I click the test, it shows the array before and after sorting, successfully sorted. One last thing to look at is this binary search test that requires an array to be made first. So I'll click on creating that array of 100,000 elements. 
Of course, the binary search does not work until you actually sort that array. So I must sort it first, right here. It takes about three seconds to sort that array. And now the binary search for the number, let's search for, how about the number 14, since I see it's only in there once. So let's search for 14. I'll show you this code in just a second. As the binary search runs, it displays the, as in the book show, the iteration, the first, last, mid values of the variables, and then what it found at that particular midpoint, until at the very end, after about 16 iterations, it finally found the number 14. Now let's take a look at the code. The code. There's the code. Let's go up to where we click on that button. Uh, first of all, we'll come up to here where we click on the button. Here's the sort, and that's the vector sort. We're looking for the insertion sort uh, button. That one's been done. Let's go all the way up to where we're running the uh, binary search. There we go. Here's the binary search action. I don't do any listing of arrays. I've already listed the arrays and sorted parts of them. In this part here, I get the text that has been entered in that text field called text field search. That's something that I created. You did not have at the uh, starting point. So I created that text field search. I do a get text of it parse it into an integer, and then I search for that number. And in order to get that string that I can display, I send it an array of strings as a parameter, which is initially an array of one string. When I'm done with the search, I append that string to my text area. I do not want the binary search algorithm to do anything but the search and put information into the string that I pass to it as a parameter. It returns the result that it, the number that it found. So let's take a look at that binary search over in the sorting. And where is the binary search? Let's see, where did I put that? There's a rule of third. There's the binary search. With the, I changed the name so it would, this would be the version that displays the string. I had another version here that didn't worry about displaying any information. It just found something. That was very boring. It didn't give me information. This one here, as I search through the array given to it, it appends to that string the information about what what it's finding. And here's the part right here where I'll increase that size a little bit here. Right there is where it adds information to that string each time through the loop. To give you some informative information after the search is complete, then that string can be displayed in the text area. And so that's it for the chapter 14 uh, code assignments. All the code now available to you.